there's a thousand different ways to find deals, right? And uh, like you can dial for dollars, right? Like there's, uh, you can drive for dollars. You can talk about it on social media. You can have a podcast. You can, but there's there's essentially all techniques fall in one of two categories. Hey guys, so today I have a very special guest. His name is Tim Bratz. Um, Tim Bratz is buys, develops, and holds apartment buildings. He currently has around six thousand units, and it's worth upwards of four hundred million dollars. Um, Tim, how you doing today? Thank you for coming. Good man. Hey, just a quick. Yeah. I I have transacted over six thousand units. I currently hold about three thousand of those. So I bought and sold some apartment buildings. I bought and sold hundreds and hundreds of single family and uh, self storage and a whole bunch of other stuff. But current portfolio is around three hundred. Uh, or 3,000 doors, around $300 million of property. But we've done pr over half a billion dollars of deals, over 6,000 units. So just wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, mislead anybody. I want to make sure that you guys have all the all the real numbers there. Yeah, that's 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 true. All right, guys. So, um, yeah, so th the purpose of this call the is, is to really know, you know, what you would do starting again from what you know now, right? And so... You know what, what we want to know is like what's the long-term strategy when we're getting into investing the way you see it yeah i mean here's the thing dude everybody gets involved in real estate for that allure of resident or, or residual income and and passive income and then a lot of times people get stuck in that transactional trap right i need to go and make money in order to then go buy rental properties and build up that residual income and so they start wholesaling and they start flipping and uh, I think it's a great way to build some good skill sets to oversee contractors, to find off market deals and do some things in that regard. Um, the issue is you don't want to stay there, right? Like I've, uh, I do coaching and I, I, I'm a part of a whole bunch of different masterminds and I see guys sitting in the room and I'm like, dude, if I have the same problems 12 years from now, as I have today, which some of these guys do, I'm like, how is that possible that you still have, like, uh, why am I even listening? Because they're obviously not taking uh, the business seriously. They're not taking coaching seriously. They're not taking, um, you know, uh, peer review and, and ideas and strategies and those kinds of things and actually implementing them because there's no friggin' way anybody should have the same problems or be in the same situation 12 years from now as they are today. Right. And so, uh, that's number one, man, is like always be trying to continuously improve and always trying to move the needle forward. Um, and, and figure out what you like, what you don't like, what works, what doesn't work, and continuously be refining. This isn't a one-time type uh, of business where you, you create a strategy today and it works forever. It's like, it's a it's a an actively um, always ever-changing, very dynamic type of a business. And um, that doesn't mean that there's some time, there's not time-tested principles that you can follow, uh, but you need to understand there's different tools, different strategies, different techniques that work in different types of markets. And so um, understanding how to find deals is a great way, right? Understanding how to renovate deals is a great skill to learn. Understanding how to raise private money, understanding how to secure financing and be bankable, understanding how to operate real estate, understanding different exit strategies and creative exit strategies. Those creative exit strategies can be used as creative acquisition strategies too, right? And so uh, understanding a lot of those different things and then having a lot of tools in the tool belt uh, is going to help you. And dude, there's nothing better that people can be doing than investing in themselves, right? Like being on podcasts and and uh, surfing the internet and being in the right forums and joining coaching or, or, you know, masterminds or whatever that looks like. That was the trajectory. That was the thing that changed my trajectory was getting around people that could give me active insights on how to get to the next level. And then implementing a couple of those key um, strategies, ideas, techniques. And, uh, you know, I'd go out to a mastermind, for instance, uh, once every quarter. And for the next 90 days, I just try to implement one or two things, not five, not three, one to two at most. And that, that the ones that would, you know, knock over the most dominoes and that would help me hit that next level um, of growth. And then, next every next level of growth has a next level of problems has a next level of you know hurdles and headaches and so that next level of growth allowed me to then hit my next hurdle hit my next bottleneck and then guess what 90 days later i had another mastermind i was able to then punch through that so i think dude there's nothing that's going to change your trajectory better than getting in a community right like like this we're getting in a community um, that like you're putting together and making sure that you're having these types of conversations because most entrepreneurs are not, man. And so I give you a lot of accolades for for putting this together and putting the value out there.
Yeah, thank you, Tim. So yeah, I really appreciate you when you say that you have to invest in yourself in order and get around people who are also investing in yourself in themselves so that you can get growing and, and become a bigger person. So you mentioned one of the most important things in which I think is like um, to learn how do we get more properties, right? Because that's the, the first thing is how do we get properties, right? And so how are how did you in your early years get properties into your pipeline so that you can look at, at the best? There's a, there's a thousand different ways to find deals, right? And uh, like you could dial for dollars, right? Like there's, uh, you can drive for dollars. You can talk about it on social media. You can have a podcast. You can, have, but there's there's essentially all techniques fall in one of two categories. One's more of like hunting strategies, and the other one's more of fishing strategies. So like having a website and having social media is more of like a fishing strategy. Talking about what you're doing, having a podcast, uh, engaging with people, talking about how do you find deals, right? And then all of a sudden, somebody hits you up and they say. Hey dude, I have a deal. Can I sell it to you? And then, and then, right. That's a fishing strategy. You're not actively hunting or looking for those deals. The active hunting ones is dude, going out, making offers on the MLS, making offers on expired listings, making offers on withdrawn listings, making offers on loop net, making offers on driving for dollars, dialing for dollars, calling for sale by owners, calling for rent by owners. Those are active hunting strategies is what I call them yeah. that are very uh, you know, eventually a ratio appears. And if you make a hundred offers, how many deals actually come through from that? Now you have predictability, right? When that ratio appears and you're, you're measuring metrics, if you don't have metrics, dude, you, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it. You cannot manage it. So you got to have metrics in place. And as you have metrics in place, you can create predictability in your business. Before it was like, turn on the marketing machine. Great. We got all these deals come in, turn off the marketing machine because we got to work through these deals. We work through those deals. And as we work through the tail end of them, I'm like, great. What's in the pipeline? There wasn't anything in the pipeline because we turned off the marketing machine. You got to always be marketing for deals, always be making offers all the time. Uh, regardless of how much deal flow you have, because that was what creates consistency. And, um, and by having understanding your metrics, now you know how much, how many offers you need to make in order to have predictable results in your business over time. And, uh, and then from there, now, dude, I know if I make 100 offers this month, I'm going to get three deals. Great. If I want uh, four to five deals next month, then I need to make probably 150 uh, offers, right? Now you have predictability of, of scaling up or scaling down the activity of yourself or your team in order to then create predictable results in your business. So that's really the bigger key, right? But, um, you know, number of deals closed or number of units purchased, dude, that's a, that's a uh, result, right? That's the goal, but that's not what you can actually control. And, yeah. and, and that's the, that's the issue. People set these goals based on the results uh, and then they try to just, you know, they, they're not paying attention to the activities that actually achieve those results. So what is the actual daily recurring activity that you can focus on? And for sourcing deals, it's making offers. Dude, if you're not making offers every single day, you're not going to have predictable results. You need to be ripping out offers every single day, whether you're buying single family, multifamily, other types of commercial real estate. You need to be making offers every day because if you're not making offers, people can't say yes and they can't say no. So yeah, be, by making offers, that creates the predictable results. And then uh, it achieves whatever those goals are. I want to close this many deals, but that's not closing deals. There's a lot of variables that can go wrong between the time that you make the offer. You know, there could be title issues. There could be financing issues. They could be due diligence issues. There could be uh, a thousand different things, right? That are out of your control. Uh, and those things happen, but the things that you can control, right? You want to control the controllables, which is how many offers do you make on a daily basis? Amazing. So, um, tracking is very important to us, right? And we, we got to track the amount of offers that we do on a daily basis. And that's the recurring things that we have to do. Those are the inputs, which then lead to the outputs. Is, is that right? Yep. Awesome. And, and so how do we avoid working on the wrong stuff? Because a lot of us work all of the hours in the day. And we're not growing as fast as we want to be. So we're working on the wrong stuff. Yeah. I mean, dude, just because you're active doesn't mean you're productive. Right. And it's like, uh, there's really only a handful of things that, that drive revenue, right? You're building a business and in business revenue solves all problems. 
right? So you need to be driving revenue. Oh, uh, I had a lawsuit that popped up. Great. Go make more money so you can hire the attorney. Ah, uh, shit. Uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a roof that needs to be replaced. Great. Go make more money so that way you can pay for that, right? I need to hire a COO. Great. Go make more money. And then you can hire the, the amount of staff that you need. If you're focused on revenue and always driving revenue, everything else falls into place. So you need to become aware of what are the activities that drive revenue, right? So what are the things that actually make you money? And that's down the center line of what your focus should be. Every step away, every degree away from that center line that you get, you're making less and less money. So you need to be on the revenue line or adjacent to the revenue line, especially as the CEO of your company all the time. So focus on the revenue generating activities. If you don't know what those are, track your day. Dude, go through and every 15 minutes, write down what you do for an entire week. From the time you wake up to the time you put your head back on the pillow at nighttime, what did you do? And did that activity make money or not, right? Just put a dollar sign or a zero next to it. And if you can track that and you can, you can take all the things that have zeros next to it and staff those out to an assistant so that way you can focus on the revenue generating activities, dude, you'll triple your income over the next 12 months. That's incredible. Okay. So, you know, we, we, we asked ourselves this question is like, why can't we 10 X our business? And a lot of times it is like, we need to hire more people or we need to partner with more people. Is that right? And, and so I want to ask you, you know, how do we hire or partner with a players, you know, because these are the people that make our business. These are people that help us grow. So, yeah. Well, well I think, I think there's definitely, you know, when I was like in the turnkey space and flipping houses, um, you know, let's say we're doing five to eight houses a month, right? And we're doing around 100 houses a year. So we're doing five to eight houses a month. If you ask yourself, hey, how do I get to uh, 12 houses or 10 houses or 15 houses a month? That's not of a that's not enough of a stretch of a question where you're like, oh, well, I just need to do more of what I'm already doing, right? It's typically the answer that somebody lands on versus how do I go from five houses a month to 50 houses a month? Dude, that's a different question. And that, that brings a different result. So like the 10X thing, um, you know, how do you 10 times your business, 10 times your results? Well, you can't possibly just do more of the same thing because there's not enough time in the day to do that. So it's like, all right, what are other strategies that I can, implement. I, I have to figure out different processes. I have to figure out different procedures. I have to build out a team. Like it's, it's more strategic, more business development type answers that come from, you know, asking yourself those bigger questions. So whether you want to get to 50 or not, you should be asking yourself those questions because that's going to help you get to 20 deals a month or, or whatever that looks like. So, um, or maintain eight deals a month, but have better lifestyle, right? That to me is growth just as much as growing the number of deals that you're doing. It's just like growing my lifestyle for where I am in my life is more important to me than making more money. Another million dollars a year, dude, does not change my lifestyle in the least, right? Um, and the reality is probably another five to $10 million a year wouldn't even change my lifestyle. So it's like, to me, it's it's growing lifestyle where I am today versus, um, and the time freedom that it, that it creates more so than growing the dollars that it creates. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that, that goes back to like asking yourself those bigger questions. Right. And then how do you, how do you partner with a players is what you said is, well, one, you can, uh, attract them by paying them, right? Like whether you're hiring an a player, dude, you just gotta realize you gotta write a check for that. Um, they're, and they're going to cost more than what a B player or what a C player is going to cost. But realize it's not an expense. It's, an, it's a, an investment. And if you pay somebody $100,000 a year, they should be able to generate $500,000 a year in revenue for you, right? Minimum 3X, preferably five to even 10 times as much in revenue, um, especially for a revenue type person, like a, a, a role like a like an acquisitions person or somebody who's in sales, like they should be generating minimum five times that whatever their income is in revenue for the company. Uh, so that's, that's one, you can just write a big check. And, and another psychological thing that I've realized is like, Oh, it's not, you know, when I hired an in-house attorney, I was like, Oh dude, this is $10,000 a month, or this is $120,000, right. For this person. No, it's not. It's 10 grand a month. And if it doesn't work out, 
then it's a $30,000 risk, not a $120,000 risk, right? Like the psychology of that is different. And you will find, is that person an investment or are they an expense within the first 30 to 60 to 90 days for sure? And you can make a pivot or make a move based on that. So it's not really the big risk that we all build up to be in our in our own heads. It's usually a lot less than um, than what we're building up. So number one is hiring that person, just writing a big check, right? Second thing is there's fractional people that you can hire. You can hire uh, a fractional CFO. You can hire, hire a fractional CMO, right? A chief marketing officer. You, there's fractional COOs. Um, there's there's people that you could hire if you can't write a check for uh, 15 grand a month for that person. Uh, they'll come and work with you one day a week for three, four, five grand a month. You know, And so it allows them uh, to come into your business and you have access to those people, but without having to write the bigger check. There's also mastermind groups, right? If you have a mastermind group, um, you essentially have a bunch of mentors and you have a bunch of people that are advising and, and mentoring and coaching you um, in your business. And it allows you to tap into that network. And that might only be a thousand to $2,000 a month, right? And you have many different resources who are marketing experts, who are operational experts, who are uh, human resources experts, right? And so uh, they can actually kind of act as your board of directors for your business. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And then the other thing is, dude, structure it as some sort of a profit share or equity play, right? And if you attract an A player and they see the big picture, of where this business could be going, you can say, hey, let me pay you a baseline of $60,000 a year, but you get a percentage of all the upside too. Maybe you get 10, 20, 30% of the profit share on how the business does at the end. And that can turn into 150 or 200 or $300,000 a year roll in order to attract some of those A players. Uh, so you gotta get creative on it, man. Same way that you can get creative on, you know, uh, act, acquiring a property and seller financing and different levers that you can pull on that front. You can do the same thing to attract a players into your business. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, and what, what would you say for us to become the leaders that can attract the type of talent? I mean, that's a key. Like it doesn't matter how much you pay somebody. If you're a bad leader and you're not painting a good vision and you don't have good core values, dude, you're not going to keep, a players, right? You might be able to trick them into coming and working for you for a little bit, but you're not going to keep those A players. So it's like dating, dude. It's uh, you need to become the person you want to attract, right? If you want to attract loyal people, I would first look introspectively at myself. Am I a loyal friend? Am I a loyal spouse? Am I a loyal uh, coworker? Am I a loyal business partner, right? And by being a loyal person, to the, to the people that are on your team, that is going to come and you're going to attract loyal people into the business, right? Um, realizing that, guess what, dude? Uh, you're going to go through hard times and when times are good, you better um, compensate and reward your team very, very well uh, when that happens. If they're going to work through the hard times with you, you, you expect to, uh, to take care of them, make sure that they're taken care of in the good times. And so... Um, my team's seen me do that, right? I've sacrificed personally, gone without paychecks to make sure they did get paychecks. But guess what? When times are good and I'm taking bigger paychecks, they don't complain. They don't bitch. They don't moan about what's going on. And, uh, oh, Tim's making this much money and we're only making this much money. Because they remember when times were skinny and I went without a paycheck for a long time and they still got paid. Um, and at the same time, dude, as they've been with me longer, as they've produced more, as they've um, grown as individuals as well, uh, their their compensation goes up and their uh, time off and their their freedom and ability to go and travel and work from home and um, and then eventually they vest into equity in these different deals and so I think that's a big um, part of it is is realizing that uh, dude if they're making a long term commitment then you need to make a long term commitment to them and so be the leader that attracts the type of people that you want to attract and make sure that you as a leader. Um, hold on to those traits and exemplify those traits of the people that you want to attract into your organization. Yep. How, how are we supposed to do that? Make a list, dude. What, I mean, uh, what, what do you value out of employees? Ownership mentality. That's what I value. I want somebody who takes, 
takes the bull by the horns and runs with it, right? So guess what? Dude, when I'm walking a property and I see litter outside, even though I'm the CEO and I own thousands and thousands of doors, hundreds of millions of dollars of property, I go and pick up the trash because I want the team seeing me having an ownership mentality that I'm willing to pick up the trash. I'm walking the building and I'm knocking on doors and talking to tenants and, you know, engaging with them and asking them what's good, what's not good, how, how can we improve things, right? And I'm leading by example. And by leading by example, everybody's going to see the example and then they're going to follow that example. But if you're the type of person that's like, ah, I'm not going to pick up that wrapper, like call the maintenance guy to do that. Do you think they're going to give a shit about your money and how much it costs to have a maintenance guy drive 30 minutes of the property to pick up trash, then throw it away and then drive 30 minutes back. Dude, it's going to take an hour and a half at $30 an hour. So it's going to cost you $45 to pick up a piece of plastic versus you having an ownership mentality and showing and leading by example, then they're going to have that same ownership mentality. And then they don't waste $45. And that $45 over time and over scale adds up to a lot of money that can making the difference in a successful business and an unsuccessful business. Great. Thank you. Um, and I want to touch on, we did the marketing app, uh, aspect of the, of how to get the deals. Um, how do we finance these deals in this current market? Do you have some? Uh, yeah, man. I mean, listen, the banks and the interest rates are bananas right now. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's not easy. Um, getting deals underwritten, right? Because sellers have not really come down much on their asking price. That that value has been burned into their heads so much that um, they're pretty stubborn right now. And so interest rates have gone up and now a lot of deals don't work, um, right? And so if they do, it's super low leverage, meaning you know, 50, 60% loan to value Whereas before there were people getting 80, 85% loan to value. And so, uh, you know, now you can't get the financing or you have to raise way more money, which then dilutes the pot on you know, how much equity you're giving up or uh, makes it a lot more work. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do that. So um, what are the levers that you can pull? Well, I think uh, one is seller financing. You know, can you go and, and get the seller to be the bank instead of you getting a new bank loan? In the commercial world where I uh, live and, and breathe and, and do all my business. Uh, loans are typically assumable, meaning if somebody refinanced two years ago at super low interest rates, that is an assumable loan. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'm looking at a 50 unit apartment building in, in Ohio right now uh, in a great location. And the, the seller refinanced a couple of years ago and has like a $7 million loan on the, on the deal at four and a half percent interest rate. I can step in and I can take over that loan. They want to sell the building for $10 million. The way the cash flow, everything shakes out, they still need to, I, I required them, or I requested that they carry back $1 million. And so they're carrying back a million dollars at a 3% interest rate. And then I'm assuming $7 million at a 4.5% interest rate. So if you do the math on that, my blended cost of capital is around 4%, four and a quarter percent, whatever. And then I have to go and raise private money on $2 million. Now, my private money is about 10%. Um, but the way that I'm going to shake it out is probably I'm going to pay them 5% as we go and then let the other 5% accrue. So that takes my blended cost of capital overall $10 million. I have $7 million at 4.5% interest rate. I have $1 million at 3% interest rate. And I have $2 million at a 5% interest rate. And you blend it all out and it ends up being around what's called 4.5% uh, or maybe a little less than 4.5%. No, right around that. It'll be right around that, um, which allows me now to cash flow positive the property. And the, you know, I might be buying at a six percent cap rate, which means there's a little bit of a spread there. My my cost of capital is four and a half. The return on investment or cap rate is six percent. So there's enough of a spread where it cash flows positive, and then I can bump the rents over the next few years, and I can pay down enough principal on the loan over the next few years. Where five years down the road, I should be able to refinance pull out some equity, pay back my investors, hold on to the property long-term. So that's the, um, that's the game plan on, on that deal. And so, um, yeah, man, I think that's, again, realizing that there are different levers that you can pull and different ways that you can access money, whether that's from raising private money, seller financing, uh, taking over somebody's existing loan. Um, there's a lot of different strategies on that front. Hey, hey, Tim, th thanks for that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about 
how do we make these properties worth more? You know, what are some of your go-to strategies that, that, uh, that you do to, to make the value go up? Yeah. So, you know, the, the cash flow world, um, and income generating properties is all about, uh, the income method, right? You're taking a look at income minus expenses equals the net operating income. And that's how properties are valued. It's called the income approach, uh, investment properties anyways. And so, uh, you got to look at the different levers again that you can pull, right? And so, how do you increase the income? Well, there's a lot of things you can improve the units. You know, maybe maybe you don't need to improve the units, and it's just they haven't raised the rents in five years, and there's natural rent increases. Maybe you improve the units, and you can bump the rents even further, right? Because now you have granite countertops and and you know wood LVT floors and um, you know, stainless steel appliances and updated bathrooms and kitchens and all those other things. So you're doing those kinds of things in order to then, you know, uh, be able to charge a premium. Maybe there's other things that you can do. Maybe you can install coin operated laundry and make a couple extra dollars there. It's an amenity that actually makes money, you know, as opposed to a swimming pool that just, dude, it's a added expense and nobody's in, like, it's just a pain in the ass to maintain. It increases the expenses and you don't want to do that. Right. So I always look at, amenities that I can add that that make me more money. A dog park. How does a dog park make you money? Well, it attracts pet owners that charge uh, that we charge a, a pet fee to and charge a monthly premium on their rent because they have a pet. And so it's a very low cost amenity to implement, but it increases revenue. You know, maybe you have a uh, an unused basement area in a building that you own um, or some some warehouse or something in the back that's not being used. Maybe you can put little lockers in and, and charge for storage, right? Like that's a big need for people who are in apartments uh, because there's not enough storage uh, area. So, you know, doing things like that of looking for amenities that you can implement that actually generate revenue um, is one of the top things that we do. And then expenses fall in one of five categories, taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, and management. And so looking at each one of those um, and different varying degrees of those, you know, utilities, you got water utilities, you got heat, uh, like gas potentially, and then um, you have power and electric. And so how can you reduce each one of those different things? Maybe you bill it back to the tenants. Maybe you put in LED light fixtures and reduce the electric bill by 25%. Maybe you install low flow toilets and, and shower heads and faucets that reduce the water bill by 30 or 40%. Um, there's things like that that you can do to reduce some of those expenses. So I'm looking at every variable on the profit and loss statement, uh, every single line item and seeing how can we reduce this? How can we reduce this? How can we reduce on all the expenses? And then I'm looking at all the income and saying, hey, how, what are some other ways that we can increase the income? And as you increase income and as you decrease expenses, the net operating income increases, which is uh, you know based on um, the multiples in that marketplace, sells at a much higher multiple and um, uh, makes a bigger impact. So like for every dollar that you can save or increase the net operating income by, uh, you're increasing the property value by about $15. So um, take it very seriously when you look at the profit and loss statement. Yeah, yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, and I wanna talk about the exit that, that you usually go about doing. You, you mentioned you like to refinance. Um, you know, What's your strategy when it comes to investing do you hold forever or do you refinance at a certain time or you know can you walk us through yeah yeah i would say that um there's a lot of different strategies right my goal is not to uh just get rich quick i want to build wealth over time and the longer you're in real estate the more you understand about uh rental real estate the real wealth is built by owning and holding properties over time over time the property appreciates, rents bump up, and then you, you make principal payments and you reduce your, your um, loan balance. And all of a sudden you find yourself with this huge spread down the road. Um, you can always refinance and pull some cash out, or you can just eventually pay off the property and then you have more cash flow and more distributions and you know a, a great legacy type of an asset to pass down to your family. Um, so it just kind of depends on your business model. I've, I've transacted thousands of doors um, because I realized that some of those 
C-class buildings isn't where I wanted to be long-term. And I wanted to graduate into B-class and A-class type properties eventually, but I needed to start somewhere. And so I started with C-class. So they serve their purpose. I sold those. And now I'm in a more B and A-class type properties. And so um, realizing that there's different purposes and depending on where you are in your journey, uh, it might make sense to buy something and not hold it long-term. But for where I am now, I'm just focused on the long-term legacy kind of assets, the nice properties and nice areas that we can in-house manage, put great financing terms on, and then hold forever. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so when it comes to the negotiation, do you have a, a, a framework, some, some kind of uh, simple uh, mental model that you use to, to get uh, you know, the person into the right price or the right zone? Uh, the fair zone so that you guys can transact or yeah i mean for me um there's definitely an art to sales and an art to negotiations and getting to the seller's motivation and um working through that uh for me i sometimes sometimes if it's a property i really really want i'll i'll dive deep into that but mostly um I don't get it. I don't get attached to any one deal for the most part. Um, you know, real estate to me is a vehicle that leads to financial freedom, which allows me to do other things, right? And, and pay pay it forward to charity and and send my kids whatever school that I want to take them to, or or travel the world, or help other families and help people in in hard times, like doing things like that. So I don't get attached. I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't love real estate per se. I love what real estate can do on the wealth building side of things. And so I don't get attached to any one deal. Uh, and for me, it's more of a sorting game than anything else. I sort past bad deals and crazy sellers and uh, non-responsive sellers in order to find the ones that are motivated. So it's more of a, uh, a numbers game to me of offers, 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 and eventually somebody bites, right? And then we can dive in. Is this something that we really want to pursue or not or what number and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I mean, I think the number one negotiating skill is being able to walk away from a deal. If you go into every deal, not needing the deal and not um, whether you're a buyer that needs to buy or a seller that needs to sell, you never want to be in that position. So I go into every deal of like, listen, I'd love to make a deal. If we can't make a deal, it's no sweat off my back. I'll hold on to this property longer if I need to, or I, I'll buy somebody else's property if if uh, you don't want to sell. Um, and I'm willing to walk away from every single deal. And the more you're willing to walk away, the better deal that you're willing to make. And the less that you're willing to walk away, the worse deal that, that you're going to make. And so um, if you're able and willing to walk away from a deal at all times, you're going to negotiate a better deal than than the other person on the other side of the table. And that's, that's more of, of my skill or my, my style is like, listen, I'd love to make a deal happen, but I don't need to make a deal happen. Right. Uh, I'd love to hire you, but I don't need to hire you. Right. I'd love to sell this to you, but I don't need to sell. I'd love to raise private money. I'd love to borrow your money, but I don't need, need to. Right. And so by me being in that position, uh, I can negotiate better terms, right? With a buyer, with a seller, with a lender, with an employee, with whoever of, I want to, but I don't have to. And I think if you adopt that mentality, as you grow your business, you'll make better deals, uh, across the board. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to touch on a little bit about when it comes to how can we ensure that this carries on going forward? And when we talk about our business, you know, what kind of mentality should we have so that we know that once we start this machine, that this machine keeps on going by itself? And, um, like, like passing down the business you're saying? Well, well yeah. And, and let it, let it operate on its own so you can go travel and you can give it to your kids or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, a business, if you're going in, like I own multiple businesses too, right? I have a social media marketing business. I have a coaching consulting business. I have a software, um, uh, a SaaS business. I have um, multiple different companies, and many of those come like like the way that those companies maintain is by making sure you have the right personnel and people in place in order to continue operating those companies. So that way, you don't have to be there all the time. If you don't have that team built out, then 
and that company is reliant upon you and you don't go to work, then you're not going to keep on making any money. The beauty about real estate is I can buy an asset that is a residual income producing asset, not a passive but a residual, meaning you do something once, it pays you over and over and over again on repeat. And then layer it with property management, whether that's my own in-house property management or third-party property management. Um, that should, like, it's it's hard to mess up a residual income producing asset, right? And so uh, I haven't had very good luck with third-party property management. So we brought a lot of that in-house mm -hmm. and uh, we control it much more than third-party ever has. And uh, we get better results that way. And so I've built out the management team internally in order then, uh, you know, property man, there's, there's uh, the property that's residual income, right? And then you have the site level staff, and then you have the third party management or my internal team. And so by the time it gets to me, man, it's got to go through many different layers of people. Um, and it needs to be a really big problem by the time it gets to me. Uh, and it usually doesn't. And so, um, that's that's the key, right? Like I can take my business and it can be improperly run and it can go to zero. But you can take a piece of real estate, it can be improperly run and maybe only lose 20 or 30 percent of its value, you know, and then you can fire sale it if you had to. But that's the that's the beauty about maintaining wealth in real estate is it's hard to mess it up uh, unless somebody's really, really bad at their role. Right. So I think this is a good time to end. Um, but where, where can we find you um, if the, the audience wants to know more of you? Um, where can they go see you and uh, and work with you if they if they want to? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm I'm active on social media, so uh, you can shoot me uh, a message on Instagram at Tim Bratz, right? Uh, you can shoot me a message on Facebook, Tim Bratz. I'm on TikTok. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on YouTube at Legacy Wealth. And so just hit me up either at Legacy Wealth or at Tim Bratz. And um, yeah, let me know what you got going on. If there's a way that I can be a resource, point you in the right direction or share some ideas, share some value. Uh, if you're looking for a mastermind, we host a uh, one of the best masterminds with the highest value, highest, um, uh, uh, res like the greatest results and the greatest reviews of any mastermind in the country from a uh, definitely commercial real estate, real estate in, in general, and even entrepreneurship uh, and personal wealth building. So that's called Legacy Family. Legacy Family Mastermind is uh, is that group. We get together three times a year in big summits. We get together three times a year in smaller, more intimate kind of meetup type settings. And, uh, and we do daily boardroom calls as well to just support our members. And Dude, the entire thing is less than the cost of a, of a virtual assistant on a monthly basis. So it's a super, super high value network and a lot of players in there. But, um, but that, you know, I put out a ton of free content on social media too. So uh, just stay plugged into the network. Let me know if I can be a resource for you. And if I can, happy to, happy to point people in the right direction. So appreciate you. And uh, uh, thanks for having me, Julian. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Appreciate you.